So um, today, uh, sorry, last week uh, we talked about the intermissions about subjects, the teaching staff and descriptions of the learning objectives and also information and everything. And we discussed about the changes um, at the beginning of this, um, this section. And we've done two activities about the introduction introduction to the uh, to this subject right, about sensory control for mechanic systems. And then in the tutorial, I think we've done something with uh, with Malin already. And um, that's following up. To move it. That's following up with the activity two from the last from the last lecture. Right, so it's about fetch, robots, navigation, and grasping. I shared the video. So this video is done by one of my PhD students. He described it already, and he's working with Baidu. I, I don't know if you heard of it. It's a very, it's a Chinese version of um, of Google, and he's working he's working on self uh, autonomous driving at the moment, and with a very good server. I think it's hybrid. All right. So this is what he did uh, within. Uh, within like one or two hours or something with fetch. And you will do similar things with fetch if you want, but uh, previously you can work with the, uh, the real robot, but, um, uh, but now I can't, I can't do it. So if you choose, um, uh, choose projects with fetch, you are more or less working on fetch simulator. All right, so this is the, uh, this is a, a video about activity two. And the questions comes to how many problems involved in this application, and what sensors and control methods are used in, each, in solving each of the problem. So, um, can I get some of your ideas? So, feel free to uh, to unmute your microphone and um, and speak. Um, you would have navigation problems, like yes, finding issues. Yeah, you would have to locate where the thing you want to lift up is. Yeah, yeah that's right. So, and for each for solving each of the problem, what sensors control methods are used? You could have um some like a laser, like time of flight sensor for avoiding stuff, and a camera to locate where. You want to pick thing up? Yeah, that's uh, that's that's very good. That's very good. Thanks a lot. So, any others has uh, other pendings on that? All right. So that's that's move a bit forward. Thanks a lot. So, um, the online teaching has a very bad experience on um, interactions, right? <laughs> All right, so this is what I lose, but not limited to that. So um, I think it's more, you more or less like answer all of, all of the questions. So the first problem is about navigation, or we call the localization for the problem of the robot, right? So the robot starts from a archery location, and it wants to uh, uh, move to the, uh, at the, at the front of the, of the desk autonomously. So we have to do the navigation. And um, the robot navigation, in 2D case, as I mentioned before, the best way is to use 2D lasers. 2D lasers. Uh, that's the uh, very re uh, reliable way of doing the navigation. So remember that. But the thing is, for that environment, if you can see, there are lots of like um, uh, glass. There are lots of glass around. Right? So in that case, the laser cannot work with that. So my PhD used RGBD sensor as well, F sensor as well, together with the uh, uh, with the 2D laser, and um, but what I mean is, if you have a uh, indoor to indoor environment, you want your robot to move um, 2D, then the best sensor will be 2D laser, technically. All right, but in this case, we use RGB and RGB sensor as well because of the glass around. Then uh, another problem I list is object recognition. So uh, after the robot moves in front. Of the desk, it needs to um, it needs to recognize the uh, the object on the table, right? And also it needs to estimate the shape of the of the uh, of the object, and also the location and the pose of the uh, um, of the object. Then uh, you can 
do the e can plan e can do the planning for the group task group it, right so this is um uh, this is for the object recognition and the other one we call it a visual server i mean they can, it can be done by others it's like when you know the um, location of uh, location of the object and then you can still see it from the, the camera then uh, as as what we mentioned in the last lecture we can do a visual serving to pick it up by the group so for fetch robots it's a mobile base and also a um, and also a seven joint um, arm as well with the group then uh, on the head there is an RGBD sensor, and on the on the uh, on the base moving base, there is a 2D laser. So for the last two last two problems, uh, the best thing is to use RGBD. I mean, for the object recognition strategy, use the RGBD, RGBD sensor, RGBD cameras, and with the depth, it's quite easy to to uh, uh, recognize the shape and also calculate its location instead of using a pure RGBD camera. RGB camera. And for visual serving, you can use both. So you can use a pure RGB, RGB uh, camera as well. So I'll show you some examples about object recognition, which uh, which done by uh, one of our graduate PhD. And then um, I'll show you some examples about how it changed from a pure RGB camera to RGB sensors and uh, this um, this lecture. All right, so. Um, Another thing about about uh, the visual serving is we may use four sensors as well because um, on the gripper on the inner side of the gripper there are uh, four sensors they want they don't want the robot to grip something when they grip something so um, when they grab something so um, uh, they use four sensor on the inner on the inner side of the group as well. Right, so those are the uh, problems and sensors they use to solve each of the problems. And why, why I want to show you this and have those two um, activities on that is, again, I think I mentioned in the uh, very last of last uh, last lecture, is um, we, I want you to have a general idea about solving a project. I do believe in the future, if you're still doing similar or related things in your future career, then uh, you do have, or even some other like engineering area, that you do have projects. And then when you find projects, then um, the first thing is you need to you need to divide the whole problem into small specific problems. You solve it one by one, or step by step, and. By solving each smaller but simpler problem, then you need to choose your own sensors and the um, maybe the the, the the method, the control method you can do, you can directly find online. Then solve each of the problem and combine them together by dividing. Then you solve the complete project. So this is what what we always do for our projects, and I do. I do want you to have this kind of like idea about how to how to manage how to how to manage and how to solve the electronics projects. All right, so this is the things we have. Um, uh, this is the thing we have in the last lecture, and let's move to today's lecture. So today we are mainly talking about cameras, which is a really really common and cheap. Like solution of the sensor that we can use for mechanics or robotic systems, right? And um, today, uh, sorry for the uh, for this for the next three lectures, we will have three. Uh, we will we will introduce three different sensors. The first one is what we talk today about the cameras, and then the next one will be the RGBD cameras, and then the time of flight sensors. And after that, and before. And also before we introduce in the control part, we will have one lecture about the feature introduction and management. And um, this is the management about the sensor part. And today we're talking about cameras and um, we will uh, focus on the fundamentals and data and processing. And, and on, in the Panda activities, 
In the Honda activities, we will have camera calibration. So you will know what is kind of uh, what's what is camera calibration, what you can get from camera calibration, and also the convolution as well. Right. And um, in the lecture part, first we will uh, have very short introduction about different sensors, which is a general idea about sensors. Then we will start with camera geometry. So camera geometry is super super important. Again, super super important. Because if you want to use camera, and anything related to the camera about geometry, you need to know, you need to know about camera geometry, or we call it camera projection. So which means, suppose you have a 3D point in the, um, in the environment, and then from the camera projection, you will know where will the projection on the image. So that's the uh, camera projection, or we call it camera geometry. Again, that is very, very important. If you use your camera in, if you use the camera in your future project or any other things, and that's the very, very basic thing you need to know. All right, so that's the uh, camera geometry. And after that, we will introduce calibration. I will not show too much about how to do the cal calibration. I will just let you know what you can get from cal uh, cal calibration. And then uh, in the hand activities, Molini will have you to work on the calibration by yourself, right? And um, the very last way I will introduce a very simple but used for image processing tool, which is convolution. If you want to do, if you want to change your image from the original one to the one that you want to use. Later, then the convolution is the uh, very commonly used method. Then, uh, for example, you can make your um, you, you can make your image blur, and you can also to um, to to enhance the uh, the the edge to do some edge detection after that. So that is convolution, and it's quite easy to do. Just use a kernel matrix, apply it onto the image, then you can find a transform image. Right. right, so that's the um, that's the things we covered in today's lecture. Then let's move to the introduction of the sensors. The definition of the sensors. So uh, here is the one um, uh, from a uh, from the handbook of modern sensors. The sensor is a transducer that received an input signal and responds with another signal. And bearing a no relation to the input. So there are three information in this definition. One, the first one is the first one is you have an input signal. So that's it, right? And the second one is there is a output signal after you have that input signal. And the third one, which is the most important one, is you need to know the relationship between the input and output signal. The last one is super important. For example, if you have a camera, then you take a picture, and from that picture, you know there is a mountain, there is a car, and there is a road on the image. So you know the relationship between the image and the real world, right? But think about if you take a picture, but on the picture they are white noise, and you don't know what the relation is, then it's not useful, then it's not a sensor. Right? A sensor means you need to have input and output, and definitely you need to know the relationship between the input and output thing. That is quite important. Right. Right. And uh, for the sensors at the beginning. The sensors are from the biological sensor, which means people have some sensors. And at the beginning, the sensors are mainly from what people have on the sensors point of view. So for the people, we have five senses, five signs, right? So we can see, we can hear, we can smell, we can taste, and we can touch. Then for, for the sight sensors, the people can see. The people can see. And sensors can see something as well. This is what we make cameras, but the sensors can do much better 
than what we can do. For example, our, our eyes can only see a limited, a limited band on the EM spectrum. And that's what we call it visible band. But the sensors can, the cameras can do much better than that. So the sensors can do, can do, um, um, for example, in, infrared cameras. So they can, they can have net vision, and also they can detect temperature as well, right? And um, as you know, I did my PhD in, uh, sorry, bachelor and PhD in photography and remote sensing. So in remote sensing, there are a lot of cameras, we call it multi-spectrum camera or hyperspectral camera. So which means on their camera, it can get multiple images and each of the image will only from a channel on the uh, EM spectrum. Right, so for example, if you have a, a very huge um, uh, EM spectrum, and then we can use multi-spectrum camera or hyperspectrum camera, then we can get multiple or even two or three hundred images, and each of image represents a channel on the spectrum. Right, and uh, this, it is really commonly used on the satellite to observe the Earth. I have a lot of uh, classmates that are doing this kind of research at the moment. Right, so uh, this is about the uh, like people seeing something, right? And another sensor is about hearing. And again, the human can only uh, can only hear a limited band white on the frequency. But the sensors can do better. For example, the ultrasound. So we all we use ultrasound to do the photo or the pregnancy like checking, like what I showed um, on the image. And also we can use ultrasound to detect any other things like the heart. So on the on the bottom right image is a 3D ultrasound for the heart. We call it the TWE. We call it TWE ultrasound. So that's the heart we can observe from the 3D ultrasound. It's a 3D view of the, it's a 3D view. It's the 3D view, uh, it's the 3 view of a 3D ultrasound, but it uh, represents the heart. It's an invisible, it's an invisible image about the heart. Then this is only about, only from hearing. So hearing can only make it as the image, which is much better than what we can do, right? And uh, we have some other 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 senses, which from the, the human as well, for example, the uh, touching. So we can touch, if we close our eyes, we can touch the environment and then we can move, right? If the, the laser sensor is like similar. So the laser, instead of like to do the real touching, they use the the laser. They use the uh, the laser to do that kind of touching, and then it gets the reflections, and they can get the distance about the environment, and it can move. Right, and also, and also we have some false senses. As I mentioned, uh, we have two false senses on grippers um, um, on the fetch. Then it can it can uh, it can detect the force. When it's like when it's grip something, right? So that's the uh, the touching as well. And um, for the sensors, we can mainly divide it into two uh, two camps. One is active, we call it active sensors, and the other is passive sensors. It's quite obvious, right? So active sensors that require their own source of illumination. For example, the laser is the one. They need to like, send the laser out and then receive the laser. And also sonar. Sonar is like it sends the sounds out and receives the sounds. It also readers as well. And but for the passive sensors, um, for example, the cameras, it relies on the nature conditions. You don't have to send something out and receive it. It just receives things, you know, just receive the signals, and it can report some other signals which can be used. And that's the passive sense, for example, the uh, the, uh, the camera. 
For the camera, I mean the normal camera. And for RGBD cameras, is um, it's, it's active as well. All right, so that's the two cams. Then uh, let me introduce some of the traditional sensors very briefly, and then uh, we will move to the camera. So the first one is Sonar. Sonar, the full name of Sonar is the Sound Navigation and Ranging. And um, as we know, it's really, really commonly used in the water and also in the wall. Right? The main principle is it generates a ping, which is a sound, then a listening for the echo. Then the, the distance can be calculated based on the, uh, the different, the time difference. As we know the speed, as we know the speed of the sound, then we can calculate the distance. Right? So that's the main principle of the sonar. And also is a it's an active, it's an active sensor instead of passive because it's generating the sound. Then um the soda is not that commonly used in the uh, mechatronics or robotics area, but it's really, really commonly used in the marine area. You can measure the, uh, the depths of the marine, of the sea base. And also, uh, if you like fishing, you, there are some fish fenders, fish fenders on the boat, right? And that is also soda. Because in, in the water, in the water, we can't use two. We, we can't use any. We can't use other sensors. Other sensors cannot may not work in the water. For example, we have two projects about the underwater uh, underwater robots. Then we put the camera on it, and the camera can only have a very short vision, even with illumination on the, on the robot. Then uh, what we can do is for the um, for the for the deep deep uh, like underwater robot, which is cut one or two meters above the seabed, then we can use camera with illumination as well. The, but if we want if we want the uh, the underwater robot a bit higher than the seabed, then we have to use solar. So that is really, really commonly used. And I also did a project when I did my PhD. I did my PhD in Beijing, then uh, it's a uh, mapping of the seabed, and we use multi beam sonar. So, as we know, sonar, if there's a, only one beam, then it can only detect a distance, a distance from one direction. But we can put multiple beams together on a line, and then when we move forward, it's like it can scan the seabed. It can see, scan the seabed, and we can we can map, we can do the mapping of the seabed from the multi beam zone. Right. And um, and 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 also uh, as I I showed on the right of the two figures, two image two pictures, so for the two uh, sorry, two or three mobile robots, we also we also use soda to do a collaboration. We try that it's not that is not as good as using the lasers, but if lasers not available, then we can use an array of sonars to localize the robot. And this is um, one of our, our PhD's work about that. Right, so that's the sonars. And the next one is laser. Laser is really, really commonly used in electronics or robotics. It's really commonly used because is much, much more accurate comparing to sonar. And also it has multi, um, it has multi beam as well. I'll show you, uh, I will explain to you how it makes multi beams. So um, laser, laser is similar to sonar, but instead of sending sounds out, it sends lights out. It sends the, uh, it sends the, um, the, the laser light pulses. And then measure the time of flight of the of the later process. Then the principle is like similar. It's, it measures the time difference and it calculates the 
calculate the distance because we know the uh, because we know the speed of the of the light, right? Then it is quite quite important because it's a it's a it's a laser. It can focus a lot, so um, so we can get a very very accurate measurement about the distance. And another good thing is because it's laser, it's light, so we can we can deflect it by using a rotating mirror. So that's why if you have a laser, more or less, it is supposed to do this, so more or less you can have like 180 or 270 degrees about the scan. And also the resolution of the angle will, is quite high as well, because it's, it's light and we can deflect it by using a rotating mirror, so which is quite easy to get a laser scan instead of making it more beam. Right, so uh, that's why laser is quite popular used in uh, in robotics. Right, and about the applications, the uh, the most important thing is about survey. So uh, you may find the top uh, the top right figure that is survey from the uh, from lidar on. The, uh, on the on the UAV, so uh, we have we have one of the projects when I did my PhD before. So it is really commonly used in the remote sensing and photogrammetry area. We just use um, the laser on the airplane or on the satellite. Then we can do the survey. We can do the survey based on that, and also mapping as well. And about localization. The, uh, the uh, as I said, for most of the robots, 2D robots, if you want to do localization in the 2D indoor environment, that's the ideal, that's the ideal sensor. Again, that's the ideal sensor. And also, uh, if you want to do the outdoor autonomous driving, the 3D LiDAR is the ideal one. It's definitely the ideal one. And we also use a lot of robotics as well, and uh, it can also like do the object uh, object checking or detection as well. So if you uh, play with the Kitty dataset before, it has it has the three uh, D three D laser or called a three D lidar dataset, and they can do object detection as well. They're as well. Right, so that's the laser. Then the radars. It is not that commonly used in uh, in uh, in our sorry in our in our uh, in our life, but uh, it definitely used a lot in the um, in the army, and can and also it can it, it is definitely used in the weather forecasting as well. So the principle is like similar, but just different sources. So um, for the aircraft detection, it's used a lot. So now they use the, uh, the, the radars to detect the aircraft. And also in, uh, they use a lot in the airplane. And I think, sorry, the, the, uh, the, the airports, you can, I think you can see it. You can see the, the, the radars in the airport, in, in, in all of the airports. Missile guidance, um, that's, the, uh, that's the, the army things. And weather forecasting. They use a lot for weather, uh, weather forecasting, and you can see from the two two pictures on the bottom right, so those are the images from the, the radars uh, from the satellite. So I'm uh, I did my PhD in in photogrammetry and, and remote sensing. I have some classmates; they are working in the National Weather Forecasting uh, Institute in China. And most of their sensors they use are all about readers. And they put readers on the um, on on the satellite and observe the uh, observe the Earth and do the weather uh, forecasting. All right. So those are the um, the sense sensors that was briefly introduced, and then we move to camera. The camera, this uh, the camera technology has developed significantly in, in, the, in the past couple of years, and I uh, I do remember when I was quite uh, when I was a kid, so we always playing with the the camera, but with the films. But now no one playing with films anymore. So now it's everything is digital. But after digital, after we have digital cameras and we get images, it's a digital image as well different from the, the film one, 
that uh, is much easier for us to use. And on the image, if you zoom it in and in and in, and then you will find some small square blocks on the image, and we call them pixels. So if on each of the pixels, if you have an RGB camera, which is color cam, color image, it has three channels. It has three channels. And for each of the channel, it's saved one intensity, which represents the intensity of that color. So we always have like three channels, which represents R, G, and B. And for each of the image, it's a grayscale image. Grayscale image, it's which in each pixel is so it saves um, it saves intensity on that, which represents intensity of that color. And then if you fuse them together, and you have a color image. Right. And another thing, another thing about the image or camera is about image size. I think you've heard a lot about your your camera or your your camera on your phone that has like ten megapixels or even. 18 megapixels, so that represents the size, the size of the image. So 18 megapixel, 18 megapixel image represents that on one image you have 18 megapixels. So that's the size of the uh, the image. Then uh, there are some formats as well. So now we always use to have or T or PNG, but um, for for some others, if you want to use raw image instead of like compressed one, then TIFF, raw, and NEF are the ones that we may use. But nowadays, especially if you want to use the camera on the robot, we are not always using raw image. We always use the, the compressed one instead. I'll give you one example about, um, about this kind of like image format. So when I started doing the uh, surgical robotics project at Imperial, Imperial College, so we have a project about, I think I've shown you before, about the uh, taxa robots uh, to do the endovascular interventions, which is inside the vessel. And we use the intravascular ultrasound. And we save, so we use the ultrasound image as raw data at the very beginning, because we want to maximize the, uh, the accuracy accuracy of the uh, of the uh, localization and uh, muscle reconstruction during the surgery. So we use raw image at the beginning. At the beginning. And um, it's a 800 by 800, 800 by 800 grayscale image. Right? And the, um, the frame rate is about 40. 40 hertz, like 40 frames a second. And at a, when, when we use the raw data for that, uh, for that images, then uh, it is about, I think when we only run about less than one minute, and the raw spark file is, is around 10 gigabits. So that's a lot. And after that, we change it to the compact one, we change it to just to JPEG, and then it's reduced a lot. For one minute, it's just like one or two, 200 megabytes, something like that. It's reduced a lot, and it doesn't reduce too much on accuracy. So, uh, so later, we use the compact one. All right, and also the interfaces. And the uh, the cheaper cameras only about the um, uh, USB the USB uh, interfaces, and but it's not that kind of fast. And we use uh, the firmware before, but it's not a common one now. I think when uh, we use the, the firmware camera, when I just start doing things on robotics in two thousand nine, and that is much faster than the USB one. And it's quite popular in robotics, but now the most the most popular one is the Gigabyte Ethernet. The Ethernet one is cheap, it's really fast, and it's quite easy to do the, the synchronization as well. So there are some options about doing about using cameras. All right, then as I said, the camera can do much better than than people. 
we use infrared. We can use infrared cameras. An infrared camera can do the net region and can also detect the uh, detect the temperature as well. So if um, um, if you uh, if you want to get into a country from board uh, at the airport, and there are lots of like infrared camera to detect the temperature, and especially now it's um, it's much much more much more serious of detecting the temperature at the moment. Right then, let's move to the uh, camera geometry. The camera geometry again is super super important because it's the it's really the basis about the camera. You want to use camera, you want to use the information from the camera, you need to know where the, um, the your projection comes from, right? Then uh, that's the uh, that's the camera geometry. And here we only focus on a single wheel geometry, which is the really basic one. Then after that, when we move to the R2D sensors, at the beginning I'll introduce a little bit on the uh, stereo camera. Then I will show you the two wheel geometry on the stereo camera. But here it's only the single wheel geometry. Right? And the cam most of the camera it obeys the, the pinhole model. The pinhole model. So which means suppose you have a 3D point in the world here, and the projection will be mainly there. And O is the is the the uh, the principal point, I mean the, the camera, the camera principal point optical or optical center on that, or camera center on that. So that's the pinhole camera. And based on the model of the pinhole camera, that's try to that's try to calculate. Suppose we have suppose we have a 3D point in the world, and where is the location of its projection? On the image, let's try to find it out. Where is it? Right. Then here is a um, simplified figure about this projection. So suppose here is the three D point, which is x, y, and z. That's a three D point, capital X. And then here is the camera center, and this is the image plane, and the point. The point of the uh, projection from the 3D point on the image is here. Right, so any questions about this figure? So any questions, just stop me, please. Any questions, just stop me, please. I want all of you to know about how to do this projection, all right? So, again, suppose we have a 3D point X, capital X here, and we want to calculate the 2D location of the projection on the image, which is small x here. Right? And here, in this figure is the, is the relation. And the C is the camera center. And the, uh, this plane is the image plane. And the Z axis is the principal axis, which is the forward axis from the camera center. All right, so if this figure is all right, let's try to solve, let's try to solve the projection from it. The first thing is let's try to project this figure onto the Y Z plane. So this is the YZ plane of that figure. And we can see here is the 3D point in the world, and here is the 2D point on the image, which is which is the three points, which is the three 3D points projection. And here's the camera center. And this vertical line is the image plane. All right. And the distance between the image and the camera center is the focal length. This distance is the focal length. And from this figure, we want to calculate this distance, which is the y coordinate of that projection on the image, right? So from this figure, we can see that the angle of this triangle, sorry. Oops. 
So this angle of this triangle is the same as this angle of this smaller triangle. And from this similar, similar triangle property, we can find this distance divided by this one is equal to this distance, C to Z, this distance divided by C to P, this distance. Right? Then we have, so this distance, this distance is the Z coordinate of the, of the 3D point, right? Sorry, is the Y, sorry, is the Y coordinate of the 3D point. And this distance, this distance is the Z coordinate of that 3D point, right? And this distance is the focal length. And this distance is what we want to calculate. And from that relation, we can calculate this distance as f times y divided by z, which is here, which is here, which is here. Any questions about it? Any questions about it? Again, this is a 3D figure, simplified 3D figure about projection relations. And then we first consider is yz prime, which is this figure. Then we find for those two, for those two triangles, this direction, sorry, this distance which is the y coordinate of the 3D point divided by this, this distance, which is the y coordinate or v coordinate of the projection on the image is equal to this distance CZ, which is the z coordinate of the, of the 3D point divided by CP this distance, which is the focal length. And we know focal length, and we know the y and z coordinates of the 3D point, then we can calculate the y coordinate of the 2D point on the image, right? So which is this? F times y divided by z, right? And if you consider the xz x z point from that 3D figure, it will be it will be similar to this yz point. Then we can get it we can get it similar, which the x coordinate of the 2D point on the image is f times x divided by z, which is similar as this figure. It just replace you just replace y by x and you get the similar figure. And we can get the x coordinate of the 2D point similar to that. Then we calculate the x, y location of the principle, of the, sorry, of the projection on the image. And this process we call it central projection. Central projection. All right. Any questions about the central projection? All right, so if you have any questions about the projection, do let me know because it's super, super important. All right, right. Then let's come back to this figure. Let's come back to this figure. There is a point P. P is here and P is here as well, right? Here's a point P. That that point P is the interaction between the principal axis and the image point. We call it the principal point. We call it principal point. All right, and then we use the principal point later. Then we introduce the uh, central, central projection with the principal point offset. Why we are doing that is, if you remember, 
the coordinate we calculated, we calculated here, we calculated here, is with the uh, with the origin of the principal point. So here we calculate this distance, and we after we calculate the small x and y of, of the location of that 2D point, the origin is here. Here is P, and P is the principal point. But for most of the images, for most of the images, the uh, origin is not at the principal point. Uh, it's always top left, but I mean, we rotated the bit. I will introduce a bit later. I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt a bit. So suppose a origin of the image, which we always use that is the top left, but the x, y we calculated is with the origin of the principal point. Then we need to move, we need to move the origin from the principal point to the uh, I mean, top left. So the, the, this figure is the inverse point. So to the top left. So which means we need to do the principal point offset. That is quite easy. If you know, suppose we get the x, y from here which is what we got from central projection. And suppose we know the location of the principal point, which is Px and Py on the image. We just plus Px on the x we, we calculated and plus Py on the y we calculated. And then we can find, we can find a location of the projection with respect to the uh, image coordinates with image origin, right? So this is central projection with principal point offset, all right? So if you want to calculate a projection from a 3D point, if you want to use central projection with principal point offset, use this equation. Again, use this equation, all right? So that is central projection and plus Px and Py are, are the uh, uh, principal point offset. That's the central projection with principal point offset. Then we can also rewrite the equation about the central projection with principal point offset by using, by using the matrix format. And here is the matrix format. The F is the uh, focal length. P is the principal point, and this is a three by four matrix, and this small x, y, z, and one represents the three D point in the real world. And why we are adding one here is we use the homogeneous presentation of a three D point. It's a bit, um, it's a, I think it's a bit confusing, but I try to explain it to you, and it's better to know that because. In most of the cases, we use the uh, matrix format about the projection, and we do use homogeneous presentation about that. Okay, so homo for homogeneous presentation, we use, suppose it's a 3D point. 3D point, we always use three elements to present this location, right? But for a homogeneous, for a homogeneous presentation, uh, presentation of a point, of a 3D point, it use four these four elements to present a 3D point. And the, uh, and for very a very simple way is, suppose you have X, Y, and Z, then you just put one here. And that's a homogeneous presentation. And why we are using that and why we are calling it as homogeneous presentation is, if we multiply a number, a non-zero number on this, sorry, on um, this homogeneous, homogeneous point, then it represents the same point. For example, if we times 10 on this, it will be 10 times uh, x, 10 times y, 10 times z, and 10 here, it represents the same point. Why is that is, if you want to convert the homogeneous homogeneous point into a normal 3D point, you need to use the first element to divide by the last one, which is your x, the second element divided by 
the last one, which is your y, and the z, uh, the third element divided by the last one, which is your z, right? So for example, if we times 10 on this, it will be 10 times x, 10 times y, 10 times z, and 10. And if you want to convert it into the, uh, the normal x, y, normal location of the 3D point, we use 10 times x divided by 10, which is x, 10 times over y divided by 10, which is y, and 10 times z divided by 10, which is z. So that's the same. So that's homogeneous transition. And what we get, And what we get so a homogeneous one, the normal one. And if we want to convert it into the normal from the uh, from the homogeneous one to the normal 2D location, we just use we just use the first element divided by the last one, which is your x or your v or your u, and the second element divided by z, which is your y or your u. And then you can get your to the location, normal to the location of the projection on the 2D image. Right? So this is the matrix format about percentual projection with principal and offset, and also together with the homogeneous presentation. All right. So again, if you want to use the matrix format to calculate the projection, the first thing you need to do is you need to add one on the 3D location. It's X, Y, Z, and one there. And you perform this multipl multiplication, matrix multiplication. Then you have a three by one vector, which is also the homogeneous 2D point. And if you want to convert it into a normal 2D point, which is U and V or X and Y, then you use the first element divided the last one and the second element divided by the last one. Then you have your normal 2D point on the image, all right? Then from this three, from this, this three by four matrix, we can also write it something like this. We put K out and in this, in this matrix, there's still a three by four one, but the first the three by three, it will be in density. There will be infinity matrix. And the last column will be three zero. Right? And the K matrix can be can be rewritten, sorry, can be rewritten as this one. You can see on the diagonal is a block diagonal, the diagonal is focal length, focal length in one. And on the last column is uh, PX and PY in one. And the others are zero. And this matrix only, only includes only includes the focal length and the principal point, right? And as we know, for a fixed lens, the uh, focal length and principal point are fixed. So we call it camera intrinsic parameter or intrinsic matrix or camera calibration matrix. And following, I will show you, and also on the HANA package, I'll show you how to calculate those numbers those numbers, all right? Then, after the central projection with the principal point offset, then um, it's, we have the a general case, which includes the camera rotation and translation. If we go back to, the, to this figure, the central projection with the principal point offset, then the 3D point, the 3D point here is in the camera coordinate frame shown here. So this is camera coordinate frame. The center is the orange is the camera center and the z-axis is the principal axis. Right? And for the central projection and the principal offset, we have the 3D point. We have the 3D point. We have the 3D point in the camera coordinate frame. But in most of the cases, the 3D point is not in the camera coordinate frame. Right? It's, um, there's a point in the world coordinate frame or global coordinate frame, 
and your camera can move, and your camera has an, a separate on the frame. We call the camera can call the frame. So in this case, how to do the uh, projection? It is quite simple. The first thing is if we have a 3D point in the world called the frame, and if we know the transformation between the uh, world called the frame and the camera called the frame, if we know the rotation and translation, which is the pose of the camera, or the transformations between the world called frame to the camera called frame, the first thing we can do is we can transform a 3D point in the world coordinate frame to the camera coordinate frame. And after that, we have a 3D, we have a 3D point in the camera coordinate frame. Then we can use the central projection with the principal point offset as what we did before. Right? So quite simple. If you have a 3D point in the overall world coordinate frame, and the first thing is you need to transform that point from the world column frame into the camera column frame. And then, and then we can use the central projection with the principal offset, which is what we have before. So if we write it in the in the metric format, it is something like that. Right? So suppose we have a we have a 3D point in the global corner frame. Then first, we need to use this transformation, transformation matrix, R is the 3D, 3 by 3 rotation matrix, and C is the camera center or the translation vector, which is 3 by 1. We need to use this 4 by 4 transformation matrix to transform this 3D point in the global corner frame into the camera corner frame, right? And then after that, we can use the central projection with the principal offset. So that this is uh, this this is the uh, matrix format about this general camera projection, and we can rewrite it as here as well. So um, here is K, here's the rotation matrix, and this one is a three by four matrix, and the first three by three is is an identity matrix, and then the matrix is. Is a matrix, it's a three by three matrix. On the diagonal, they are all one, and off diagonal, they are all zero. And the last, the last column is a three by one vector, which is minus C or minus T, minus translation. And this X, again, this capital X is a homogeneous presentation, which is a four by one. So if you have a location with X, Y, and Z, and then here is X, Y, Z, and one. And you can calculate the homogeneous 2D point, which is small x, from this equation. And that small x is a 3 by 1, which is also homogeneous. And if you want to calculate the true location, which is UV location or XY location, you can use the first element divided by the last one, and second element divided by the last one, and you have a new and All right, so that is the general, general camera projection in the matrix format. All right. And from this matrix, if we consider, if we consider the matrix before the capital X as P, and that P is called camera projection matrix, which means if you have a camera with its pose as well, then uh, from a from a 3D point in the world corner frame, you can just use that matrix and do the projection. That's it. That is the camera projection matrix. And here is a projection chain for a general case. Suppose you have, a, again, suppose you have a point in the world coordinate. And then the first thing is to transform that point into camera coordinate frame. And then to do the uh, central projection with the principal point offset. All right. So any questions about projection, camera projection? So do make sure you know how to do this. Do that right. So that let me give you a very brief um, conclusion about this camera projection. Suppose you you have a question about doing this projection from a three D point on image, and the question wants you to calculate the location of that three D point on the image, right? So if so, the first thing is you need to check out if that three D point is in the world coordinate frame or in the camera coordinate frame. 
If it is in the camera corner frame, then you use this equation. You use the central projection with the principal offset, or you use the uh, you use the matrix formula as well. So if you find that 3D point is in the camera corner frame instead of in the world corner frame, then use the equations of the central projection with the principal offset, right? Then if you find the point, the 3D point you want to project it is in the world corner frame, which is different from the camera corner frame, then this equation is what you are going to use. That is the general case, and you need to use this equation. All right. All good. All right. So if all good, let's do our activity one. So try to do it by yourself and make sure you know how to do it. All right. So activity one is we have an image with resolution 724 times 768, and the principal point is 520 and 389. And you have a focal length of 935. And if we have a 3D point in the camera coordinate frame, which is 15, 10, and 80, and calculate the image point U and V. All right, again, the 3D point is in the camera coordinate frame. So which means you will use the central projection with the principal point of that instead of using the general case. All right, so try to calculate the UV by yourself and let me know when you have an answer. Let's do it now.
All right. So can I have your answer, please? Or I need more time? Um, I think most of you will know how to do it, right? So let's uh, try to do it together. Uh, I so the um, the map the map on my laptop is a campus license, so I can't open that. So I show the uh, the code. So this code is uh, what um, I put on the UTS online. Then you can have a look. Um, so uh, the first thing is you have x, y, and z, right? So that's the um, that's the location of the three D point. And again, that point, as described in the um, uh, in in the question, it is in the camera corner frame. Then we just need to do the central projection with the principal point offset, right? And also we have the principal point at px as uh, 520, is that 520 or I'm changing them, I can't really remember. And the PY is uh, 389, right? And we also have focal lens as well, nice 75. And also the resolution is not that useful uh, in this case, if I give you the uh, print point already. But sometimes, sometimes the, uh, uh, they didn't give you the principal point directly, but they gave you the resolution and instead the uh, print point is in the center of the image. And then you can calculate the print point from the resolution. But this time I gave you the, uh, I gave you the, um, uh, the print point already, right? And in this case, we have, uh, we have two ways of doing that. The first way is to not use the, um, uh, not use the uh, MATLAB, sorry, the, uh, the, the matrix, um, the matrix um, equation. Right, so in this case, we have u equal to f times x divided by z and plus px. And v is f times y divided by z plus py. So that's u and v, that's the first way. And the second way is the matrix format. So first, we form the k matrix, which is the calibration matrix or intrinsic matrix. And in this one, we have focal lens, focal lens, and one on the diagonal. And on the last column is the principal point X and Y, right? and others are zero. And then the X is, sorry, the, uh, the, 3D, the homogeneous 3D point is 15, 10, 8, 80, and one. That is a column vector. That's why we use comma here, right? And the P matrix is a three by four matrix. That is the first three is one by one. So try that on your MATLAB and you will find what that matrix stands for. All right, and we time them together to get a small X, but that small X is still a homogeneous presentation of a 2D point. Then you need to Convert it into a normal 2D point UV by, if, by using the first element divided by the last one and the second element divided by the last one. Right? So those are the two ways of doing that. In the case that the uh, 3D point is in the camera corner frame. And those two methods are both for the central projection with the prince point offset. All right. So do make sure. Do make sure you know how to do it, all right? Please do make sure. Do make sure you know how to do the uh, do this projection, please. All right, then let's move a bit forward. There are some limitations about this pinhole model because that pinhole model is not the ideal case because it's, the, it's not ideally small. And sometimes there will be some, some blur some blur on the image. And also, and also because the camera lens is not that perfect, then there will be some distortion on the image. For example, if we if you look at the bottom right bottom right image and you can see the, the line and the edge column or rows of the dots in it will be straight, but on the image is not. So that's the distortion, right? And as we know, 
the intrinsic parameters, focal length and the principal points, and also the distortion, they are fixed for a camera, for a camera, right? And if we want to use the camera and calculate the projections, we need to calculate those intrinsic parameters. Why we call it intrinsic parameters? Because for a certain camera and fixed lens, the intrinsic parameters, parameters are fixed, including the uh, including including the distortions. But I'm not talking about too much on distortions. But you will, uh, you will you will find you will find out parameters later on during the uh, analytics. So, which means suppose you are working on a project with. Uh, with the camera you want to use in that project. And if that's a fixed lens one, then the first thing you need to do before you use the uh, before you use the camera is you do a calibration to calculate the intrinsic parameters. Focal lens, principal point, and also the distortions. Right? And uh, after that, after that you can consider the, the intrinsic parameters as constant during your your future work in the in that in that project. All right, so that is the uh, so that is the um, that is the uh, focal. Sorry, that is the uh, calibration. And what we always do is we use multi-plan method. We use the multi-plan method. So which means we take we use a uh, Discussion. So we use a, a calibration checkbox, use a calibration checkbox, and take the images of, from different directions of the camera, and then we use those images. We use those images to. Do the Hanek, sorry to do version two of both, we can use and you will definitely use it, definitely use it in the uh, 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 in the Hanek, Hanek activity with the MATLAB calibration toolbox. All right, so uh, for the method, I don't want to mention too much. I don't want to mention too much on the uh, on the method, but And uh, what we want, uh, and uh, the method here, I don't want to mention too much, and just need to know how to do it. And the, uh, the paper, the paper just about the method about calibration is, is the, uh, the paper I listed here, I listed here. It's a very famous paper. It's a very, very famous paper by uh, Zheng Yu Zhang. Um, he's, um, he's a very senior, a uh, research scientist in the Microsoft Research. And this paper is published in PAMI, which is the top journal in engineering. That paper is pretty good. If you are interested in, if you are interested in, um, in the methods at the back of the, um, uh, of the calibration, camera calibration, you can look at this, uh, this paper. All right, so uh, this is uh, all for today's, this is all for today's um, lecture, and then uh, let's move 